diagonal axis. Number two is differentials. Number three is workup. Number four is straight beat. So now each one of these has a way to actually put yourself forward. When someone says, what's your working diagnosis? It means that what do you actually think this case is? So it's not like something you're just going to come out of your differential paper and then you say, oh, this is what it is. No, this is basically your working diagnosis. It always, I've noticed that a lot of the students starts to tell me like a layman language. They don't even actually like, you know, use the medical terminology. They say, oh, it's an infection. What do you mean? What kind of infection? Like gastroenteritis, like hepatitis, biliary coli, cholecystitis, UTI, urinary tract infection. What do you mean by infection? Don't say just like infection or don't say like, oh, it's abuse. Sure, but you have to mention it in a way that you have to say domestic violence or uh, child abuse or for example, malnutrition or thing like that. Okay, so this is medical terminology. Use your diagnosis in a medical term. Number two, when you actually, after that, don't be hesitating to say that I need a second to think, okay? Before you give your diagnosis. Take 10 seconds, 10, 15, 10, you have three minutes. Your three minutes, don't waste it like that. You still have to, you'll be sitting in the exam, examination room for like three minutes, just like that if you answer too quick. And just say, okay, give me a minute. Or give me, I need a second, like 10 seconds to think about this. 15 seconds to think about it. Think about it. What did I have positive in this case? What are my side effects? Once you're sure, just say it all at once. Don't say two things. Oh, it can be uh, gastroenteritis or it can be an obstruction. The examiner doesn't care. He's like, which one? So therefore, why would you want to put yourself down? Why not by mentioning it twice and you got to make yourself look weaker? Might as well just say once, whoever, whatever one you feel like is the most correct, say it just at once and move forward. Say, well, I feel like it's gastroenteritis just because of the fact that he had fever, that's all. And you don't even have to explain to him. He doesn't explain, expect you to explain at all. You just he expect you to just say it. But if you feel like you have collected your thoughts and you say, okay, um, I would go with my diagnosis as gastroenteritis due to this food intake of recently and fever and nausea and vomiting. I would go with my diagnosis as gastroenteritis. But that's very collective thought after you're collectively improved your thoughts, okay? Other than that, just say your diagnosis. Don't stress about it. And don't be too minded. Sometimes you can come back and just change it and they say, okay, you know what? I would like to change my diagnosis because I just figured out that it's not like that. And um, then you go to your differential diagnosis. So differential diagnosis, a lot of guys, a lot of you guys, and as much as I've noticed, a lot of them uh, had problems with knowing that what is the differentials really mean. Some of them just give me one infection. Some of them give me oh trauma. Some of them give me like you know uh, some sort of electrolyte abnormality and oh electrolyte problems. As an examiner, if I hear these words, I know I know for a fact that you do not sound medical grad or you do not sound like a medical professional. So it's better to tell me. I think my differentials are gastroenteritis or my differentials are electrolyte abnormalities, imbalance, electrolyte imbalance, as well as I would like to go ahead and exclude the possibility of, for example, uh, pseudo depression, pseudo dementia, or things like that. Not just say, oh, forgetfulness. That does not sound good. So, number one, that's the thing. You have to use medical terminology. At least you have to provide three differentials, okay? Sometimes it might even they might even ask you four, but three is good enough. Still, like still, it's a good mark for you. Use medical terminology, okay? And always, when you have your differentials, be very close to your chief complaint. Don't be too far, okay? Yesterday I had a case. This was a case of a delirium, okay? And the person actually literally gave me dementia. So. 
now who's who's in fault sorry in my last mock i would think it was my last mock yeah it was i i don't know if it was on monday or tuesday something like that i had my last one so he said uh, oh dementia for delirium literally he knew the answer the diagnosis was delirium but he put differential as a dementia now you tell me how much far apart are dementia and delirium what well, what is the most closest to delirium is acute brief psychotic disorder electrolyte imbalances something that can cause delirium like urinary tract infections sepsis these are much more closer than delirium and depression i mean uh, dementia and depression depression doesn't happen in two days the dementia doesn't happen in two days so just look at your chief complaint and according to that actually join your case okay i mean match your differentials be as far as you can but very close to the diagnosis and to the differential i mean to your chief complaint don't go too much out far or if someone has like for example acute you present acutely with pe and you give me somebody with a basically like the diagnosis is pe and then in your differentials when i ask you then you're like oh peripheral arterial disease or somebody like uh, a deep vein thrombosis that just does not make sense because you already told me pe so why would you say deep vein thrombosis as your differential because um, if, if it was deep vein thrombosis then you could have said okay cellulitis you could have said oh knee injury you could have said muscle tear ligamentous injury because that makes more sense if it's especially DVT, right? But if someone has PE, you should tell me pneumothorax, pericarditis, myocardial infarctions. They are very closely to PE, not other things that are outside, right? So that's why keep your differentials very closely to your actual diagnosis and to your actual chief complaint. Uh, but sometimes it happens and i don't blame anyone because i have i myself cannot even come up with like differentials if you're giving me put me in this right way in one of like instances where i have to say it right away i might not understand the acuity of the case or like the chronicity of the case and things like that right? so i will lose myself but it's okay but if just just to, for the purposes of the exam take your time again every question you're asked take 10 seconds don't rush collect your thoughts and then say your things. That's the secret to your success in the post encounter. If you start to bang, 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 say it like that, you will hurt yourself. Uh, next thing is the workup. In the workup, basically, we have a lot of stuff to take care of, okay? Um, there could be a lot of things can, depending on the medical condition or the chief complaint that the patient's gonna come to. But the most important things usually that are very non-invasive, everyone starts to our order CBC, ESR, uh, CRP, electrolytes, electrolytes, <laughs> BUN, creatinine. These are very, very common, okay? And sometimes even your analysis and with your analysis with culture and stain so if you don't even know anything make sure you say at least these things because this is very very important for you and depending on how bad your case is like you know and you notice that you don't know and it's an infection related always blood culture is a good sign to put okay and these are non-invasive that's a good thing about it but a lot of people keep saying cbc you gotta understand when you say cbc if always try to use wood differentials because what happens is when I know the differentials, I can tell if this is an inflammatory condition, if this is an infection, if this like that. So a lot of people just because they fact that they know that this is, we need a CBC, they don't even say with differentials. They feel like the examiner knows already about it, which should be with differentials, right? An ESR could be just, just a waste uh, test, but it's a marker of inflammation. It's CRP a marker of inflammation, right? So the examiners don't really care. They are. If they order it, it's okay. It's not invasive and there's just a blood work. Electrolytes. Complete panel. Okay, so there's something called complete electrolyte panel or basal metabolic panel, and then there's CMP. If you call if you call CMP means complete metabolic panel means it this includes it includes also, sorry, a liver function test and some other stuff in it. <coughs> well, 
But a BMP is the basal metabolic panel is just your electrolytes, BUN, and creatine. But apparently in the Canadian exam, they expect you to say electrolytes, blood glucose level, and things like that, BUN and creatine separately, okay? So this could be okay. Blood glucose level. Uh, these are okay if you say it like this, rather than saying a CMP. In American exams, it's usually more like a complete blood count. Uh, with differentials and basal metabolic panel or complete metabolic panel and stuff like that. But in Canada, they expect you to kind of go ahead and start to say things like separately just to make sure that you're okay and you're understanding. This is just a general for everybody almost you're gonna have or CBC with differentials, ESR, CRP. You don't have to even order CRP, you just can say ESR, that's good. But if you know that someone has, <coughs> for example, polymyalgia or rheumatica, of course, CRP and ESR are still good. Both of them, right? Whichever. Electrolytes is good, blood glucose level is good, BUN, creatinine to find out the hydration status of the patient and everything like that. Your analysis with cultures and stain, usually you look at it, do I need this? Is it an infection of the body that I want to make sure like the gar urine is the garbage basically. You want to look for certain things like urine metanephrines, urine catecholamines or urine uh, in for infections. You want to look at the urine protein creatine ratio. So this is why it's very common to have that uh, urine microscopy and cultures and stain. But depending, as I say, on your case-to-case -case basis, right? But if you just answer UA, it's okay. They still wouldn't cut marks. But what they will cut marks from you is if when you order invasive tests. Let's say if someone has headache and photophobia, as well as neck rigidity, it's understandable to order CT scan first, right? First do a physical examination, order a CT scan, or possibly a lumbar puncture, but if someone has headache, right, it means there's a high pre intracranial pressure at this time. So I would do CT and I will tell them I would like to do CT first to exclude, exclude the possibility of any masses that might be present in the brain that can lead to increased intracranial pressure. And that's it. So you don't do lumbar puncture right away. But you can still, if you even do perform lumbar puncture, it's still okay. It won't cut mark because this is understandable. They haven't given you any abnormalities at this point. But just as a professional, I would do CT before I perform lumbar puncture, right? And then uh, I would go ahead, like, let's do that. But if there is no complaint about headache, there's no complaint about, like, you don't find out it's 100% lumbar, I mean, a meningitis, and you order lumbar puncture, you're losing a mark. Don't take me wrong, it's it's a loss of mark, okay? So you can be deductive marks for that. Uh, if you order, for example, MRI for uh, back, but you don't order an x-ray and the patient has no abnormal signs and symptoms of like any kind of disc herniation or any kind of like fee, uh, abscess formation at the back and you order an MRI where you could have just easily ordered an x-ray, you will lose mark for that. Another one is if you order angiography, when you know that this is not even supposed, it's ankle brachial test can perform that for you, but you order angiography. So that could possibly like, you know, or if you order a D-dimer, sorry, if you order a, a spiral CT angiogram and the patient's not PE, right? And you know that he's not 100% PE because he doesn't have no history of traveling, he doesn't have any family history of clothing, he doesn't have any history of like, you know, swelling in the leg, and you still order a CT angiogram, they will cut your marks. Rather than that, you will order something called D-dimers. That's much, much better to basically kind of uh, save yourself and tell them also that I won't exclude PE. So this is why be careful when you're ordering invasive tests. Until you're not 100% sure that this is this condition, try to avoid it as much as possible. And that will save you a lot of marks. All right? Uh, so the invasiveness of this thing is very important. And the non-invasive tests, as I wrote it there for you, it's very easy to do. Like, as I said, again, take your time, collect your thoughts, and then say what you have to say. Don't rush and start saying, blurring things out and just like, you know, be in a rush. There's three minutes after the post encounter. It's a lot, especially for like, you know, just answering simple questions. What's your working diagnosis? What's your differentials? What's your workup? And what's your treatment? And then uh, you go to the treatment. You go to the treatment and you go ahead and basically 
uh, perform the treatment according to your diagnosis. If it was like COPD, let's say you're just gonna go ahead and start them on oxygen therapy, start them on uh, major dose inhalers, start them on corticosteroids if they needed, uh, inhaled albuterols, inhaled uh, uh, ipratropiums, and then possible antibiotics if they're feverish as well, or their sputum is increased and things like that. Uh, so the time breakdown for the history taking physical examination and counseling is like, you have two minutes pre uh, entrance pre, uh, outside the door, you have eight minutes inside the room and you have three minutes post encounter, okay? So if someone has, let's say counseling, there will be no more post encounter. It will be just eight minutes inside the room and three minutes uh, for counseling. So you will continue. They will tell you to continue your examination. But if someone, you can have a physical and a history at the same uh, station as well. There is, there might be a case that has combo. It's called a combo that both history and physical examination might be present at one time. And if you reach that instance, try to take the minimal history with the most accurate, the same template, go fast over it, but do not go excessively. Don't waste too much time. Even if you leave two minutes in, um, in the last, one and a half to two minutes for your physical, you're still good, in good shape. So when you have a combo case, don't be scared. Like, oh my God, I'm gonna run out of time. No, just look at the timer and give yourself up to two minutes or even one minute and 40 seconds or something like that. You'll be pretty much fast with the physical examination. So don't stress about all those things sometimes. No problem. And uh, other than that, um, what else was I gonna say about treatment? Yeah, so the treatment is for uh, basically uh, monitoring of the patient, monitor the patient, um, take care of the basically their like environment, how this is, and uh, what were you give, you give them as a diet? That's what it is. And oxygenation status. So monitoring of his vitals, oxygenated, oxygenation status, nutrition, and also uh, what kind of other main specific treatment for the underlying conditions that you're gonna give. And that's about it. I, there is this one part, um, this, this three questions right here, I think I should copy that and put it here for you guys. Because when we're delivering the bad news, uh, there's also like these three questions that you want to ask again before that is these three questions are very important to know as well that who ordered these labs and stuff for you before we can deliver you the news right so just keep that in mind when you have to do uh all these things okay so the treatment any questions about treatments guys like diagonal post encounter questions that you guys have I have I have a question. I was I saw some like contrast information. Some some found some uh, reference saying that when you when you when you prescribe like a medication, we need to say specifically the drug, and some some others saying that we could say like the class of the drug. So uh, actually, yeah, no, I would recommend saying the name specifically, not the class of the drugs, because a lot of people come with infection. I have had students that would can, when they come to post uh, encounter questions, they just tell me, oh, uh, antibiotics. What kind of antibiotics? You don't know any antibiotics for pneumonia or you don't know any antibiotics for COPD, which is, you know, that mostly common acquired, community acquired pneumonia, it's either fluoroquinolones were given to patients if they're going out or erythromycin, like macrolides that are given uh, when they have, or they're just given like azithromycin and things like that, right? So you have, if you know that, that's much better. Like if it's inpatient or outpatient, right? If you know it, it's much better for you. It will help you get more marks. But just by saying antibiotics, it's kind of a little bit like risky, but still you never know, you might get the mark just by saying the antibiotic. So if you don't know the antibiotic, at least say antibiotics, right? But if you know the antibiotic, say the name of the antibiotic. Okay, I was referring more like, um, do I need to say like a macrolid or I need to say as or I could say like oh, a no, 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 no. 
or I need the specific name of the floor canal one that I want? Uh, no, no, I think floor canal laws by itself is good. Oh, okay. Of okay. course, yes, yes. But if you know the specific name, that's even better, right? It just it shows the level of understanding you have about medicine. That's all it is. But if you just say the family of floor canal laws, it's still okay because floor canal laws are usually prescribed for uh, in general for everything except for like ceprofloxacin that's used for GI problems and moxifloxacin that's used for <coughs> infections of the lungs and things like that, right? Levofloxacin, moxifloxacin. So if you say in general fluoroquinolones is okay, but if you know specifically what drugs is used, oh, that's even number one. Like, there's no answer to that. I mean, do it. I would say go with the first most common medications if you know it. If you don't know it, go with the family of medications. And if you don't even know that, then just say antibiotics. Okay. So it's a, according to your knowledge, how much knowledge of medicine do you have, right? So other than that, uh, yes, guys. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Otherwise, let me, we'll talk to Dr. Rosalind and uh, see what else can I explain to you guys. Any questions in general that you guys might have for me? We have like 17 minutes. And... If you want to like, you know, have ask ask about something if you really need about anything.